Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RegameZ.com video, we're going to be tackling tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We'll start things out with Intel and the deluge of information the company have unveiled regarding the 8th generation core processors. Then we'll move over to AMD and the Radeon Vega Mobile uh, graphics cards in Raven Ridge APUs. But, as I said, first things first, Intel. So, I'm going to get this right out of the way. The 8th generation of core processors is pretty confusing, and I do feel that some, especially who are not super into tech, are going to find it even more bizarre. So, basically, the 8th generation core processors are going to be based upon three different distinct architectures. The first is a Kaby Lake refresh, the second is Coffee Lake, and the third is Cannon Lake. We'll talk about the mobile side of things at first, and then we'll move over to the desktop side. So, in actuality, it's more or less the same micro-architecture as the 7th generation, but there are some key elements which distinguish it from the older generation. The first is that you get a considerable increase in the number of cores and threads. How much? Well, up to 100% gain in cores and threads. And thanks to just a 15 watt TDP, battery life should be considerably better. There are a couple of concessions from what I understand. One of the biggest is clock speeds are lower. So turbo frequencies are still pretty high, so you're not going to have issues, at least in theory, in single um, in single thread tasks. Second thing is memory support is very similar. We have DDR4 and LP DDR3, but you don't have support for low power DDR4. The good news is though, we see a increase in memory frequency support from DDR4-2133 up to DDR4-2400. For those using these ultralight devices, there is also another benefit. And that is Intel have drastically improved the graphics card. They have upgraded it from a HD 620 to a UHD 620. This basically means that 4K playback and processing should be considerably faster. Intel are touting that we should see about a 40% improvement in this thanks to architecture, the design and overall manufacturing tweaks that they've managed to wrangle into the CPUs. And they'll tell anyone who's listening that in reality, in some tasks, it could be two or even three times faster for the task to be completed. So, a lot of you right now are saying, well, okay, this is the eighth generation. Does that mean it's Coffee Lake? Not so much. Well, basically, traditionally, for those who have been following technology for some time, you'll know that typically Intel have a 12 to 18 month cycle. After that, another generation is released, and another generation, and so on and so on. What Intel have basically done here is something a bit different. This is essentially a KB Lake refresh. It's going to be built on the 14NM Plus technology, and then we're going to see Coffee Lake on 14++, uh, and then that will become part of the 8th generation. Finally, we'll see Canon Lake on the 10NM process as well. So what does this actually mean to you? You know, what if you're a desktop user? Because I realise most of you listening probably don't care so much about two-in-ones, which I don't blame you. You know, I, I not that I hate them, but for productivity work, if you're doing a lot of gaming, that type of thing, it's not ideal. Let's just be honest. Well, here's where things get a bit complex. There's not an exact release date yet, only murmurings that it's going to be sometime within autumn slash fall. This means, essentially, we should get it September, um, August time, I'm sorry, September-October time. My brain is not working too well today. And Intel have also provided a couple of images, box art, if you will, of the next core, uh, so 8th generation desktop processors. Now, what's quite interesting, and it's pretty much emboldened on the actual um, box, is that, yes, it has the UHD Graphics 630, but perhaps most obvious is that, well, it has the need for an Intel 300 series chipset motherboard. Furthermore, you'll also notice that it, of course, confirms other specifications that aren't particularly uh, surprising to anyone. Six cores plus hyper-threading, I'm just reading the i7 stuff here, Turbo Boost Technology 2, support for smart cache technology Optane, and dual-channel DDR4. So far, so not particularly surprising. 
To some, however, this can be a bit frustrating because essentially we have four new chipsets, desktop mainstream um, ones anyway, being released in about a year. You've got the Z270, the X299, the Z370, and then you'll also see the Z390 are popping up in the first quarter of next year. For those who aren't familiar, of course, X299 is for the Skylake X architecture, so yes, it's a bit different. The Z270 was for the older KB Lakes, the 7000. The Z370 is very similar to the Z270. Some are speculating there are going to be a couple of differences, mostly in power distribution, but it's not been exactly confirmed. And the Z390 does have additional features, which basically will fully take advantage. So one can make an argument that even if you were to, say, be able to buy an 8700K on launch, you may still be better off to wait for the Z390. It's, it's just a bit weird, really. And honestly, I do feel that while I do like the technology of the processor, I am very happy that Intel have moved in this direction in terms of obviously improving the number of cores in the processor, increasing the um, performance overall. Obviously, most of the stuff is in retaliation to AMD. We've seen leaked pricing, which popped up a couple of days, days ago, which essentially means that it's, well, going as a price a replacement for the older generation, at least on the desktops, which is a good thing. It means we're not going to get gouged for those additional cores slash threads. I don't like the fact that the um, eighth generation is now an umbrella name, because once again, it's going to confuse some customers, because, well... It's going to be kind of difficult for the average individual to think, okay, well, I'm getting in Coffee Lake here. This is a this is a what? Why is this a KB Lake? What 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 what's the difference between them? It's you know it's going to confuse a lot of people who are not you know necessarily that technically inclined. Furthermore, um, I don't particularly like the Z390 boards being released a bit later. I wish they would release earlier. I would like to know the reasonings behind that. I'm going to just make an assumption it just needed, needed excuse me, more time in the oven. But overall, it's positive from Intel. I like the fact that they are being more competitive to AMD. I'm not going to say you should, you know, not buy Ryzen and you should wait because obviously we don't know what the benchmarks are going to be, essentially. And to be real honest with you... <sighs> I would always advocate just getting the cheapest processor. And if you were to be able to buy a Ryzen 7 1700, um, buy a cheap motherboard like a B350, you could put the rest of that money towards, let's say, a higher-end graphics card. That's probably going to be your better way to go. And you've still got those 8 cores, 16 threads for that productivity if you need it. But I realise that some people do need every single percent of single thread performance especially if they're doing certain types of gaming but you know as usual we're going to have to just wait and see with the benchmarks to see really what um how all of this falls into place okay um now we're going to move over to amd and you think stuff with intel is confusing yep i'd like to introduce you to confusion.com also known as raven ridge apus now it's important to distinguish something as we all know although i'm very guilty of this we do know that a GPU technically is just the, the core of a graphics card. It's not, you know, the graphics card. Although most, I prefer to say GPU rather than graphics card just because it's t technically simpler. And I think most people kind of go with that acronym anyway. But obviously with Vega, it's a bit weird when we're dealing with mobile. Now, how does that work? Why is it weird? Well, because it's an APU. So what that means essentially is you've got the same, you've got a, a piece of silicon, the APU, is basically a combination of the GPU and CPU and whatever other circuitry needs to be worked, or silicon needs to be, uh, you know, on the, on the chip, and that is basically a single uh, die, which is very much like, I don't know, say the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One, and APUs aren't new. Technically, even Intel have, you know, built-in graphics cards, but this is a bit different, of course. So why is it confusing with Vega? Well, Vega 10 is the GPU code name for the desktop graphics card. It would be the Vega 64, essentially. But Radeon Vega 10 is the mobile graphics name of the GPU, which is inside Raven Ridge APU. Okay, that makes sense, right? So if you know anything about previous AMD GPUs, you know that, let's say, Polaris 10 was less powerful 
than oh, sorry more powerful than Polaris 11. It had more stream processors. Very much the same in theory for Vega 11. It will have fewer stream processors than let's say Vega 10, right? Well, here's where it gets a bit weird. From what we understand, that's going to be different for the APUs. There's been a couple of different devices. The first is Vega 8 Mobile, and its max compute units are listed as 11, whereas Vega 10 Mobile is listed as 8. So this means you've got two different distinct um, two different distinct APUs. The first is the Ryzen 7 2700U, which has the which has the Vega 10 mobile, and the 2500U, which has the Vega 8 mobile. So this means that with 11, you get 704 stream processors, which is a very arbitrary number. Typically, you would see this to be an even number, like, I don't know, 12 compute units for the sake of argument. 8 makes sense, so I do wonder if this is simply being misread, or whether it's something entirely different, to be completely honest. And I guess we can only wait. Either way, this is a good indication that AMD, of course, are readying this to be deployed to the worldwide audience of fans. And they claim that we're going to be seeing 50% more performance compared to the 7th generation APU. I think we all know who they're referring to. And 40% more GPU performance. I would love to know how this is going to compare to the new Intel uh, processors. I guess we're going to have to once again wait and see. It's a wait and see game. Anyway, that's my opinion. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.